Okay guys, in this video we are going to play around a little bit more with the mathematics of state functions using the first and second laws. And then uh, at the end, you know, the last half of the, of the presentation will, will involve uh, deriving some useful formulas uh, for, um, for, for related to Gibbs energy and how Gibbs energy depends upon temperature and pressure. So uh, what I want to point out in the first couple of slides is that there's this interesting mathematical structure involving thermodynamic functions. And here I'm calling them uh, thermodynamic potential functions. Uh, the internal energy, the enthalpy, the Helmholtz energy, and the Gibbs energy. There's an interesting structure between the potential functions and the thermodynamic variables. So the variables that we're going to be using here are the temperature, the entropy, which is a little odd to think about entropy as a, a variable. You might find it odd, but, but in fact it works quite nicely actually. Pressure and volume. So these, these four variables are complete in terms of describing a a pure closed system, that is where the number of moles of substance is fixed. And under that condition, only two of the variables are independent. And so we identify what are called um, conjugate pairs of variables. So temperature and entropy form one conjugate pair, and pressure and volume form another conjugate pair. And I'll draw your attention to the fact that within each pair there is one intensive variable, temperature over here and pressure over there, and one extensive variable. Entropy is extensive and volume is extensive. The conjugate variables, when you combine them, that is when you multiply them together, they have units of energy. So for example, the product of pressure and volume is energy. And the product of temperature and entropy has units of energy. Moreover, each, each conjugate pair is associated with a particular type of equilibrium. The temperature entropy pair is associated with thermal equilibrium and the transfer of energy associated with heat. Pressure and volume are associated with mechanical equilibrium and the transfer of energy via work. You can construct different combinations of independent variables by selecting one variable from each of the conjugate pairs. So for example, you could combine uh, the two extensive variables, entropy and volume. Or you could combine the two intensive variables, temperature and pressure. Or you can mix and match. But anyway, you choose one variable from each of the conjugate pairs, and these are the four different ways in which you can do that. Each of these four uh, sets of independent variables are the corresponding natural variables for one of the thermodynamic potential functions. And you'll see what I mean by natural variables in a few moments once we start playing around with the equations. But uh, suffice it to say that for each of these pairs of variables, they each correspond to one of our thermodynamic potential functions, that is internal energy, enthalpy, Helmholtz energy, or Gibbs energy. Uh, what we're going to be doing is playing around with these natural variables. I'm going to show you some relationships, and then from those we can, de we can derive additional relationships, which are known as the Maxwell relationships, that come from mixed partial derivatives, and I'll show you what I mean. And these can be useful uh, in different applications. So let's let's get started um, here. So we're gonna we're gonna 
play around with no idea what I did here. Hopefully that will go away and stay away. Um, so here what I'm going to do is mess around with with some of these equations. So what we're going to do, we'll start with the internal energy and our goal is to express it in terms of its natural variables. Unfortunately that's very easy to do. So we'll start with the um, let's start with the differential version of the first law of thermodynamics. So du equals dq plus dw. And so that's the first law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics, which, or which is essentially the definition of entropy, I should say, ds is equal to dq over t, and that's for reversible conditions. Furthermore, for reversible conditions, uh, assuming that there's only PV work possible, we can write the work as minus PDV. So, so these are for reversible conditions. What we're going to do is substitute those into this equation here. That's going to give us TDS for the heat term, and then for the work term, we'll have minus PDV. Now, this format that I've written here, this is what we call the natural format. And the reason, and, and what is the format? It's, it's basically you have a single variable multiplied by a differential. And so it's natural to think of u, the internal energy, to think of it as a function of entropy and volume such that when you go to write the total differential of u, I'm following that pattern that we've explored previously, such that these partial derivatives are equal to just one of the thermodynamic variables. And so what we've got here is that We're making the identification that the partial of u with respect to s at constant volume is equal to the temperature, and the partial of u with respect to volume at constant entropy is equal to minus, minus p, the pressure. Okay, so this is the natural variable format. It allows us to make identifications that are very simple like this. And there's one more thing. This is where the Maxwell relationship comes into play. Um, if we take the opposite derivatives of these expressions, so if we construct what's known as the mixed partial derivative, so for example, by taking the partial derivative with respect to volume of partial of u with respect to s at constant v, so by constructing this partial derivative, we would get partial of t with respect to v at constant entropy. So this, what I've done is I've taken this equation and I've taken the derivative of it with respect to volume at constant entropy, and we get this result. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this equation, which is the partial of u with respect to volume, I'm going to take the derivative of this with respect to entropy. So I'm forming this derivative. And that would be minus partial of p with respect to entropy at constant volume. Okay, there's for state functions, what you what you'll find is that the two mixed partial derivatives this is from this is a rule from calculus multivariable calculus that these two mixed partial derivatives must be equal to one another so the maxwell relationship is to set this equal to that so 
So this is what we call the Maxwell relationship. It relates one derivative to another. <clears throat> so these are the expressions for um, that we get for the internal energy. Let's look at let's look at the enthalpy next. So enthalpy has the thermodynamic definition U plus PV. And what I'll do is I'll form the differential of dH. dH will equal du plus PdV plus VdP, like so. I can substitute in the previous result that we had for du. We had TdS. It was minus PdV. And what we see is a cancellation of terms now. And so the natural variables for the enthalpy are S and P. And we can identify these partial derivatives. like so, and then we can also get the Maxwell relationship. So I'm going to construct the mixed partial derivative. And that's the result. We can do the same thing for the Helmholtz energy. write down the formal definition of the Helmholtz energy. We'll take the differential. We'll substitute in for du, our previous result. Let's see, I believe it's minus Vdp. minus PdV. What we'll find is the cancellation here. Uh, I prefer to have my temperature term first. And so the natural variables for the Helmholtz energy are temperature and volume. We can make the identification So, and then the Maxwell relationship is formed by taking the uh, mixed derivative this one's pretty useful actually how does the entropy of a system depend upon its volume? How does it change as you change the volume? You could derive that from the equation of state. Right? This is something that you could actually calculate from the equation of state, or you could imagine measuring it in lab, and then you could relate that data to the change in the entropy. Uh, it's not very easy to measure entropy in lab. right? I don't know how to do it. You do it indirectly using Maxwell relationships. Anyway, that's the result for the Helmholtz energy. And we can do the same thing for the Gibbs energy. Its formal definition, take the differential. Expand the dH. That's going to be du plus PdV plus VDP, expand the heat, or the, the internal energy, it's TDS, 
minus PDV. So we're going to get a cancellation here and there, and then we're going to get a, um, I left off, I left off one of the terms, there should be a plus PDV term here. Yeah, this was the minus the work, or this is the work. Then we have that term, then this term, that term, and that term. So those cancel out. We'll have minus SDT plus VDP. And so the natural variables for Gibbs energy are temperature and pressure. And we can identify these derivatives, which are very important. These derivatives are very important. Most, um, most chemistry experiments are carried out under constant temperature and pressure conditions. Gibbs energy is our criterion for spontaneity. It's very useful to know how does Gibbs energy change when you change the temperature? How does Gibbs energy change when you change the volume? I'm sorry, the pressure. And so these expressions tell you how they change. And so these should be committed to memory. These are particularly important. We're going to work with them a lot. Uh, the mixed derivative is like that. And so this is another useful, useful relationship. You can measure this stuff in lab, this derivative. You know, measure how does volume change when you change temperature, and then you can relate that to how entropy changes when you change pressure. Okay, so these are the, um, this is how you express the thermodynamic potential functions in terms of their natural variables and derive the Maxwell relationships. Here's a table that summarizes those. <clears throat> and then here we have a, um, a problem we're being asked to to look at um, we're being asked to use one of the Maxwell relationships to show that the entropy of a perfect gas is linearly dependent upon um, the natural log of volume okay so what we want to do is go to our Maxwell equations and find uh, find the Maxwell equation this one right here that relates entropy and volume. So I'm going to write that one down. And then I'll show you how to use it. So what we'll do is we'll take the Maxwell equation and we'll break up this left hand side. I'm going to write it as ds equals this derivative here times dv. Now this guy, we can calculate, since it's a perfect gas, we can calculate that derivative from the ideal gas law. Make that substitution in here. And now what we can do is integrate both sides. So we'll just... Uh, We'll let this be the entropy. There's going to be some constant A, and then the coefficient in front is going to be nR, and then the integral will be the natural log of the volume. Here I've done an indefinite integral, okay, which is what we were asked to show. Uh, here's another fun one. Uh, recall from our previous discussions that the differential, that if we think of u as a function of t and v, so these are not the natural variables for the internal energy, but we can still do this, 
uh, du was equal to CV dt plus this internal pressure dv, where CV has the definition partial of U with respect to temperature at constant volume. So that's the isochoric heat capacity. And the internal pressure is the derivative of the internal energy with respect to the volume at constant temperature. Uh, we're being asked to use the Maxwell equations to derive an expression for the internal pressure. So let's write out here uh, the definition for that. And then what I'm going to do, if we recall that in the natural variables here, du is equal to TDS minus PDV. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take this relationship and I'm going to bring the volume over. Actually, I'm going to do this right, right down here. So we'll do du equals TDS minus PDV. PDV. And so we'll bring the volume over. So we're going to form this partial derivative here. Uh, and we'll do that uh, at constant temperature. And so we're going to have T partial of S partial of V with respect to T minus the pressure. So I basically, it's like dividing both sides of the equation by dV and forming these partial derivatives at constant temperature. Now this guy, we can get from the Maxwell relationships, right? It's this, it's this Maxwell relationship right here. This is probably the most useful one. And we can write this as T partial of P partial of T with respect to volume minus the pressure. This is, in fact, the, the internal pressure. And this is the formula that we were looking for. So this is what they wanted us to find. And this is useful because if we know the equation of state, if we know how pressure depends upon other variables, then we can calculate, we can calculate the internal pressure. And that's what they're asking us to do here in this, um, in this problem. They want us to calculate the internal pressure for an ideal gas, where pressure equals nRT over V. So this, the internal pressure here is going to be T times the derivative of P with respect to T. That's going to be NR over V minus the pressure, which is NRT over V. And so we've just shown that for an ideal gas, the internal pressure is equal to zero, as it should be, because ideal gas molecules don't interact. So why would the energy change uh, when the volume changes? It, it wouldn't. So we, we get zero for the ideal gas. For the van der Waals gas, however, for the van der Waals gas, pressure is equal to nRT over V minus nB minus A squared N squared over V squared. So here, when you take the derivative with respect to temperature you get N over V minus NB. And so when you go to form the internal pressure, NR, then you would have minus the pressure, which would be this term is going to cancel that one, and you're going to be left with plus a squared n squared over v squared. This is going to be a positive term, and so as you increase the volume, because the volume of the gas gets bigger, you're going to find that the internal energy um, 
well, so it's also inversely proportional to volume squared. As the volume gets bigger, uh, th this um, pi t term, it's positive. As the volume gets bigger, you're going to find that the energy increases. And that's due to the fact that the van der Waals gas molecules are dominated by attraction. Right? That's what this term represents. It's an attractive interaction between the gas molecules. And so if you pull the molecules farther apart, they don't like that because they want to be closer together. That ends up raising the energy. OK. Well, we're going to focus now on Gibbs energy. In particular, we want to know, we want to study in more detail how Gibbs energy changes as a function of temperature and pressure. Right? These are the experimental controls that we have. Gibbs energy is our criterion for spontaneity. It also represents, the change in Gibbs energy also represents the maximum work we can get from a process. And so understanding how the Gibbs energy is affected by temperature and pressure is a very useful thing to know. So here what I've got, this is the expression for the differential of Gibbs energy in terms of its natural variables, temperature and pressure. And what we see, focusing specifically on the temperature dependence, how does it work? Gibbs energy changes with temperature according to minus the entropy. Recall from the third law of thermodynamics that entropy is always a positive quantity. So this tells us that whenever you increase the temperature of a sample at constant pressure, the Gibbs energy is going to decrease. Right? It's going to head in the direction of you know, more spontaneity. Gibbs energy is going to become smaller and smaller. Uh, for uh, pressure, the change in the Gibbs energy with respect to pressure is equal to the volume of the sample. Now, volume is always positive as well. So whenever you increase the pressure, Gibbs energy is also going to increase. Okay, so Gibbs energy always increases as you increase the pressure. Now, we'll look into this in more detail um, when we talk about phase transitions as well. These, these two relationships are crucial for understanding phase transitions. We may see a little bit of that on one of these upcoming slides. Here's sort of a bird's eye view of Gibbs energy as a function of temperature and pressure. At constant pressure, as you change the temperature, the slope of the Gibbs energy is equal to minus the entropy of your sample. If you keep um, temperature fixed but change the pressure, the slope of the Gibbs energy curve is equal to the molar volume or equal to the volume under those conditions. This one's pretty useful for phase transitions. Here we're looking at Gibbs energy versus temperature for solids, liquids, and gases. Now recall that, okay, so what we're ju we've just learned is that the Gibbs energy change with respect to temperature is equal to minus the entropy. And I'm going to go ahead and make that the molar Gibbs energy, and this will be the molar entropy. Now also recall from our discussions of, of entropy that the molar entropy of a gas is much, much larger than the molar entropy of a liquid, and that in turn is, is larger than the molar entropy of a solid. And so this fact is reflected here in this diagram. You see that the slope of the gas curve is very steep, right? because this slope is going to be very large and negative. For the solid, it's going to be the, the least steep of the slopes. It's still negative, of course. And then the liquid's going to be in between. Now, one of the things that we are going to be learning about in the phase transition temperature is that the most stable phase of a substance under a given set of conditions will have the lowest molar Gibbs energy. Right? Our criterion for spontaneity is that delta G is less than zero. So in a sense, the Gibbs energy is always trying to minimize itself. 
Well, when you're very cold, at cold temperatures, you see here that the lowest Gibbs energy is that for the solid. As you increase the temperature of the solid, its Gibbs energy decreases. But the liquid's Gibbs energy increases, is, the liquid Gibbs energy is decreasing at a higher rate with respect to temperature. And eventually it catches up to the solid. And at this point is where you're going to find equilibrium between the liquid and the solid. This is going to be the melting point of the solid. Now, at higher temperatures, the liquid molar Gibbs energy is lower than the solid Gibbs energy, so the liquid phase is the most stable at intermediate temperatures. But you see how quickly the gases Gibbs molar Gibbs energy is decreasing. At a certain point, it catches up to the liquid as the temperature gets large enough, and at this point, you're going to have boiling of that liquid. And then at temperatures beyond that, the gas is going to be the most stable, uh, the stable phase. Uh, this figure is illustrating the relationship between molar Gibbs energy and molar volume. Here we have that the molar volume of a gas is much, much larger than that of a liquid. Oops, I should have drawn that as the M liquid. And that these are somewhat comparable to one another. For some, for some substances, the solid has a larger molar volume. For other substances, it's the liquid. Well, you see, uh, you see that encapsulated here, right? The slope of the Gibbs energy with respect to pressure is very steep for uh, a gas, which has a large molar volume. But for the solid and liquid, it's, it's, not, as, it's not as large. It increases more slowly. We'll explore that a little bit further in this next uh, example problem where we are being asked to derive some expressions um, for the Gibbs energy. So starting with this partial derivative, we're being asked to calculate the difference between the Gibbs energy at some pressure p relative to the standard pressure p naught for both an ideal gas and then also for a solid liquid combination. So what we'll do is we'll rearrange this derivative. I'm going to write it as dg equals volume times dp. And then what we're going to do for the ideal gas is substitute in the equation of state nRT over p dp. For an ideal gas, volume depends uh, strongly on pressure. They're inversely proportional. So now what we'll do is we're going to integrate both sides of the equation from the standard state to the final state at some arbitrary pressure p. We're going to assume isothermal conditions here so the temperature can come out we're going to get G, G at the final pressure minus G at the initial pressure, the standard pressure of P0. That's going to be equal to nRT natural log of P over P0. So this is the relationship that they wanted us to find for the ideal gas. And we can do the same thing for the solid and liquid. In this case, molar volume does not change very much with pressure for solids and liquids. And so we can just integrate both sides directly. And we'll take the volume to be a constant. And so we'll just get that equals volume times P minus P0 when we do that integral. Okay, next we're going to look at the temperature dependence of the um, 
of the Gibbs energy. So we've got this uh, partial of G with respect to temperature, constant pressure is equal to minus the entropy. And we'll use the relationship, the definition of Gibbs energy equals H minus TS. We'll rearrange this G minus H over T equals minus S. So we can write this like so. That's one thing. And now what I'm going to point out is that, at least in terms of, of chemical reactions, what's more important, especially with respect to equilibrium, is not the Gibbs energy itself as a function of temperature. Rather, it's how does the Gibbs energy divided by temperature change with respect to temperature. It turns out that that's the fundamental thing that we want to know. And so what we'll do is we'll, we'll do some calculus here. So we can write this as, um, we can write this as one over T partial of G with respect to T at constant pressure minus G over T squared. So what I've done is I've applied the, um, the product rule to this expression to calculate this derivative. And now what we'll do is we'll take the result that we have up here and substitute it in. And we see that this term is going to cancel with that term, leaving us with minus h over t squared. This is called the, um, the Gibbs-Helmholtz equation. It also applies to changes in Gibbs energy. And so if you want to know how does the change in Gibbs energy over temperature change with temperature, you need to know the change in the in the enthalpy. And so that's very useful because you can measure this using calorimetry, and then that tells you something about how delta G depends upon temperature, which tells you something about spontaneity. Uh, you can integrate both sides of this equation. Uh, let me show you. Uh, we're running out of space a little bit, so I'm just going to move this up. What we'll do is we'll break this integral up, or this derivative up, and we can write it as d delta g over t equals minus delta h over t squared dt. And then we can integrate both sides of this. So this is going to give us, so we'll integrate this. This will be delta g at t2 over t2. Maybe we'll do f for final. Minus delta g ti, the initial. So that's this integral. Then, so we'll be integrating this side from ti to tf. We typically take delta h to be a constant over that temperature range. And so we wind up with the following result when we do the, when we do the integral. And so this relates delta G at two different temperatures through, through the enthalpy of the reaction. I should have wrote, this should be an R, not an F. And these should be Gibbs energies of reaction. So that's what we were asked to find here in this, in this equation. And so now we'll put, we'll put some of this stuff uh, well, here I have a summary of all of the equations. So this slide, we, we've got them kind of cleanly typed up so that we can use them. So you would use this to calculate the change in Gibbs energy for an ideal gas with respect to pressure changes. 
This one you would use for liquids and solids. Um, and you would use this to calculate the delta G at a different temperature. So let's say we knew delta G at one temperature, you would use this equation and the delta H value to calculate delta H to calculate delta G at a different temperature. Uh, I just want to point out, notice that this, that the Gibbs energy for the gas has this logarithmic dependence on the pressure, whereas for solids and liquids it's linear. And if we go back to this figure, indeed that's logarithmic dependence, and this for the solid and liquid it's essentially a linear dependence. Okay, so in this problem, uh, we're talking about a liquid. They give us the mass density of the liquid and they want us to estimate the change in the molar Gibbs energy when the pressure on the liquid changes by 0.1 bars. Uh, I expect this is probably gonna be pretty small. So our delta G for this process is going to end up being, um, let's go ahead and do, yeah, we'll do it molar. So we'll make this delta G M. And then it's going to be equal to the molar volume times the pressure difference. I'm just going to write that as a, well, I'll write it as P minus P zero. Um, they give us the mass density, not the molar density. So what we want to do is to take the, we'll, we'll divide by the, the mass density. So this will be 0 0.9970 grams per cubic centimeter. And then we want the molar volume. So I'm gonna multiply by the molar volume of water, sorry, the, the molar mass of water, 18.02 grams per mole. And then we wanna convert that, um, cubic centimeters to, what unit do we want to convert it to? Let's convert it to liters. So we want to then multiply this by a thousand, by 10 to the minus three uh, liters per cubic centimeter. That's good. And then we'll have the pressure difference of 0 0.1 bar and now we want to convert from liter bars to um, to joules and so that is going to be 100 joules per liter bar So I'm getting a, a very small change, 0.18 joules per mole. So not very much at all. Here's an illustration of what we've done. This formula here, the Gibbs energy is really the area of this rectangle. Right? It's the volume, which is constant, times the change in the pressure. Uh, for for a real liquid and a real or a real solid, the volume does change ever so slightly, but not very much. And so you're not going to miss that difference, really. And so this works pretty well for ordinary pressure changes. Now, if you're talking about extremely, you know, extreme pressure changes, that's not going to work, right? If you're talking about going from, you know, one atmosphere to uh, you know, the pressure at the surface of Jupiter, that's that's not going to work, right? There you're going to have to take into account the fact that the volume of your substance does change with the applied pressure. Let's see. This one is really more of the same. They want us to, um, to calculate the difference between the Gibbs energy of transition um, when you change the pressure from one bar to three megabars. So here we're going to get probably a big difference. Um, 
and then they give us the the change in the volume associated with this transition. So here, the way we can think about it, let's write this as T, uh, let's see, we'll just assume that there's two phases, alpha and beta. So we'll write for alpha at, we'll call it PI, is uh, we'll make this PF equals the Gibbs energy for the alpha phase at this standard pressure of one bar and then it's plus volume of alpha P minus P0 this would be PF I guess and then for the beta phase we have the same thing only it has a different volume. Now we take the difference between the two, so this is, we'll, we'll do beta minus alpha, so delta G for the transition, this will be at PF, equals delta G for the transition at P0, plus the change in the volume for the transition times PF minus P0. So they are telling us that they want to know by how much does the Gibbs energy change. So they want the difference between this term and that term. So I'll just write this as delta G PF minus delta G of P0 is going to be equal to the volume change. 1.0 cubic centimeters per mole times the difference in pressure, which is a lot, uh, 3 times 10 to the 11th pascals. Oh, they're doing megabar. We'll do 3 megabars. 3 megabars minus, you know, essentially 0. <laughs> 1 times 10 to the minus um, 6 megabars. And then we need to multiply that by 10 to the minus 3. That would be liters per cubic centimeter. And then we would multiply that by 100 liters bars per, no, joules per liter bar. And then to get rid of the megabars, we would do 10 to the minus 10 to the plus 6 bars per megabar. So that should get the correct number. So we've got 3. We'll just ignore that. 3 divided by 1000. times a hundred, times a million, I'm getting 300 kilojoules per mole difference. And that's, that's a significant amount, corresponding to a very large increase in pressure, right? You're going from roughly atmospheric pressure to uh, three million times atmospheric pressure and so you're going to notice that uh, in terms of the energetics of that phase transition. Uh, this figure is the uh, where we're looking at, you know, the volume change. Uh, you know, this is volume versus pressure for an ideal gas. So this is an isotherm. Uh, we normally put pressure on the other side and volume on this side. Nevertheless, we're treating volume pressure as the independent variable here. So this is that natural log dependence or that, that hyperbolic dependence. And so the when you um, when you go to calculate the change in Gibbs energy for associated with the pressure change, it's the area underneath this curve. Uh, and so that's what this problem here involves. Calculate the change in the molar Gibbs energy 
um, for a perfect gas when the pressure increases isothermally from one bar to two bar. And so here what you've got is that the delta G equals nRT natural log of PF over PI. And so if it's one mole of gas, you know, 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. And then you've got natural log of, of 2. You get 5.76 uh, joules. Oh, I forgot. I need to multiply that by 298 Kelvin. You get 1.72 kilojoules, which is a reasonable answer for for this for this problem. Uh, this is showing that <clears throat> natural log of pressure dependence that the Gibbs energy has with respect to pressure. Uh, here in this problem, we're talking about the Gibbs-Helmholtz uh, equation. So notice that they give us the Gibbs energy of formation for iron gas at 298 Kelvin. They give us the delta H for the formation of iron gas uh, at the same temperature. And then assuming that that enthalpy change is constant over this, time, over this temperature interval, they want us to calculate the delta G for the formation of iron gas at 400 Kelvin. So the reference form for iron is a metal. And so we're looking at the, this is essentially the sublimation process. So the, for, the Gibbs Helmholtz formula is that the delta G for this reaction at Tf divided by Tf is the Gibbs energy for the reaction at Ti divided by Ti equals the enthalpy of the reaction times 1 over Tf minus 1 over Ti. Okay, so we know the two temperatures, we know delta H, we know this Gibbs energy, they want us to find that Gibbs energy. So rearranging the equation for the unknown. I think I should have factored out the TF, which I will when I do the problem. Uh, that's 400 Kelvin. That's times the 370.7. That'll be divided by the initial temperature of 298. Plus the delta H value of 416 and that's times 1 over 370 minus 1 over 298 adjust that for you so I'm going to start over here and work my way that way I'm getting 388, that'll be kilojoules per mole for the new, for the new Gibbs energy of formation at 400, uh, at 400 Kelvin. Well, I'm going to go ahead and stop this video here and we'll start the new chapter uh, in the next one.